Let's just start now with the female athlete triad. And I'm going to, to illustrate the components of the female athlete triad, I'm going to start with a case report of a 29-year-old female runner who presented with a complaint of right low back pain initially only when she was running. She was running 5 to 10 miles six times a week and sometimes allowing herself a rest day. She had no ridiculous symptoms. Menstrual history is something I also will gather in terms of my history taking. She had had no menses for six months. She has never had a pregnancy. On physical examination, her height was 5 feet 4 inches and weighed 105 pounds, which gives her a body mass index, which is a measure of body fat in relation to height and weight, of 18. And that's low. That anything less than 18.5 is underweight. Normal is 18.5 to 24.9. She had some tenderness on palpation over the right SI joint, and x-rays of the pelvis and the lumbar spine were normal. So on to MRI, which you can see showing us the increased pickup and in signal in the right area here, depicting a stress fracture of the sacrum. So let's go further now to our definition of the female athlete triad, which is a syndrome, as they first labeled it, which was labeled in 1992 as being recognized to exist. The definition was then subsequently changed in 2007, hence the different definitions of the point of the triangle here. Initially, we looked at eating disorders. That then changed to disordered eating rather than having the full-blown anorexia or bulimia. Now we're looking at low energy availability, which as you can imagine, when you're speaking to one of these athletes, who has or exhibits traits of the female athlete triad are usually more receptive to accepting this. Then we look at another triangle point here, looking at amenorrhea, loss of periods, or going on to menstrual dysfunction. Once again, maybe not having the full-blown picture. And then the other corner of the triangle is osteoporosis, which has then changed the definition to osteopenia, which is once again, loss of bone mass, but not quite as severe. Changes in the skeletal system, and now we're using the definition of low bone mass. What's the prevalence? Difficult to say, because many situations, it's hidden. We don't know. They may not present themselves. The full triad is felt to be anywhere between 1.2 to 4.3%. Nichols and Bales and their group did this study for the IOC Commission. A single component, such as disordered eating, may be up to 70%, but it depends on the sport and, once again, depends on recognition and reporting. Looking at the prevalence of the eating disorders, you can see in the green box on your far left where the non-athlete is. And certainly you can see for the sports, as expected in endurance sports, aesthetic sports, how the prevalence is much greater. The disordered eating in fat, which is not a great acronym for this uh, syndrome, and we are gearing away from that to just calling it the triad. <laughs> eating disorder behavior can exist on a continuum. It can be anywhere from skipping meals to using diet pills, diuretics, could be inducing vomiting, laxatives, to the full-blown situation of a titled eating disorder of anorexia or bulimia. So that's why it's sometimes hard to actually depict. The hallmark is usually a disordered body image. As you can see in the picture, that's what the individual sees when they look in the mirror. Up to 62% of college athletes <coughs> practice some form of pathological weight control behavior. And once again, it is dependent on the sport, but you still have to look at all the sports, particularly in the college athletes who are so vulnerable. This is a busy slide, but just to show you how complicated it can be with health consequences. There are various systems that can be affected, but I'm going to concentrate on that triangle that we see right on the side here, looking at the musculoskeletal system and the reproductive system. That's our triad. When one doesn't have enough calories, I think we all know we'll get tired, we will get grumpy or irritable, but this seems to be depicted on a regular basis in these individuals. They may present with fatigue and then they come in to see us just complaining of just feeling tired. Other people living with them may find they're quite irritable, they're hungry, they have difficulty concentrating, particularly in those who are at school or even at work, one can find that that's happening. Frequent injuries is often what has them present to us. And there, are they returners, so, you know, another stress fracture or another sprain or strain? They may find that 
their athletic performance is down. They're putting in the same effort but not getting the same result. And that's what they're concerned about. And that's when they listen to you about the low energy availability, I find. In adolescence, there may be some growth failure. I think we've all seen that in Olympic athletes. Once they start, stop competing rather, such in, in gymnasts, you see a change in their body habitus. Weight loss, of course, and menstrual irregularities. Amenorrhea, looking at the A, certainly looking at the menstrual regularities, is defined as an absence of menstrual periods of three months or less than three cycles per year. So that's often a question we ask. Have you had less than six menses in a year? And those are the red lights that go flashing. Divided into two separate areas of amenorrhea is the primary amenorrhea, which is an individual has never had a period. Certainly we <coughs> will look at the up until the age of 17 if they haven't had a period, then certainly looking at investigations. Secondary amenorrhea, individual had a period and they have had several periods and then stops menstruating for that period of time. The prevalence is felt to be anywhere from 2 to 5 percent in the general population and you see that wide swing in the female athletes from 1 to 44 percent. That's really difficult. It depends a lot on reporting unless you're doing some lab work to assess that. But always remember to rule out pregnancy because that also happens in athletes who think that no, it couldn't happen. So you must rule that out. There are health, health consequences to the decreased estrogen and the change in the ratio of the estrogen and progesterone because of the amenorrhea, infertility, and there's decreased bone mass, which can lead to the osteoporosis. And Dr. Hinman will be addressing that later in our conference. But I want to say just one aspect of the bone loss in the amenorrheic athlete that if it's more than three years duration, it may not be entirely reversible, regardless of the individual's age. And studies have supported that. Barbara Drinkwater, who's an exercise physiologist on the West Coast in Seattle, has done a lot of research on this. And evidence exists that some bone can be regained if the athlete resumes normal menses or with the associated weight gain. But values may still remain low and may not necessarily normalize. Now, who's at risk? Any woman can develop any part of the triad. The highest risks, as we've seen, are endurance sports, running, cycling, swimming, and combination in triathlons, sports with body contour, revealing clothing for competition. They have to look the part, and that's a big factor I'll see in a lot of the athletes. You don't need to be an elite level athlete to exhibit this. Keep that in mind. Many times it's a recreational athlete. Sports or dance which emphasize the thin appearance such as gymnastics, figure skating, ballet. And then there's also sports that use weight categories such as rowing. And as I think we can see here, even back in the 1950s, perhaps she exhibited that as well, looking at that waist size. So I think it's been out there and we're just now starting to really appreciate the effect of it. We need to prevent it from happening. And with many things, education is so important. And we want to dispel the myths that regarding the body weight appearance, the sport, and relationship to performance. There's many pieces to this puzzle with the patient at the center. We need a multidisciplinary team as far as the physician, coach were indicated, parent in the adolescent, nutritionist, psychologist. The trainer may be the first one to see the issue that's at hand in the athlete that's at the high school or college level. Early recognition, low threshold to seeing what's going on. If you're thinking it, explore it. Sometimes it's teammates or friends or family, they may notice it and say, hmm, they're exhibiting different eating behaviors or not eating with the group. And early intervention. Don't wait too long to see if it gets worse. The treatment plan is rest and modified activities, just like for injuries. There is now a consensus statement that's come out with return to play for the triad and looking at various points that the individual has to add up to on these scales that we're looking at to see not just weight scales um, but in terms of return to play and having a contract in some situations. Hormonal workup were indicated certainly if someone has the menstrual irregularities. Bone density study, what is their bony architecture? Nutrition consult, they may say that they're eating correctly but perhaps they're not and they have the inadequate calories. Biomechanical assessment, that's not the only factor, but if their architecture is not optimum, these may then come more into play. An evaluation of their training routine, as we saw in our example, was really overdoing it. And assess for any psychological factors. 
I refer you to a great resource from the Female Athlete Triad Coalition, many of the consensus statements from the sports organizations such as the ACSM and the American Medical Society of Sports Medicine have their <coughs> position statements on this website as well as the new guidelines for return to play. Thank you.